Welcome, Sharks, to your first uh, lecture of this beautiful new year. This is going to cover the causes of the American Revolution. And when we look at this, we really look at the dates from 1763 to 1775, although you could say 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. 1763 was the end of the French-Indian War, or better known as the Seven Years' War. It was a, uh, many would consider a world war between Britain and France. Uh, and in the French-Indian War, uh, a part of that was between the French and their Indian allies and really the British and their colonial allies. At the end of the war, British wins. They gain all of French territory. Spain gets some of that French territory, and the colonists feel like they should be able to uh, expand into that westward. And also, Britain has a problem with who is actually going to pay for their defense of the colonies in North America. And so this idea of should the colony separate from the British Empire rests on this idea of representation. Actual representation, which the colonists felt that they should have actual representatives in Parliament to have a voice on how they should help Britain pay for that French Indian War. And then you have the British Parliament feeling that virtual representation, along with this idea of parliamentary sovereignty, which basically Parliament having, Parliament having supreme power, that they don't have to have uh, people there representing them, that Parliament has this sovereignty to make those decisions for them. And that's going to be the issue at hand. One of the big things that brings about the revolution is this idea and this growth, uh, growth of a national identity for the colonies. Now, really before this, as colonies were established, they were very um, separate. They had their different establishments. They had different religious affiliations. They had different geographic characteristics. And there wasn't a whole lot of sharing amongst the colonies. They were 13 unique and individual colonies. There were some common themes, however. One, they all had these local colonial governments, whether you talk about the House of Burgesses in Virginia or the Mayflower Compact uh, in Massachusetts. They all have these ideas and they have this creation of how to govern, them, govern themselves without help from the British. This is crucial because they had their own ways of taxing. They had their own policies already established. They had their own judicial uh, ways. They all had their own governors. Okay, And they were very, very independent from Britain. And many people would call this salutary neglect, where Britain kind of let the colonies do what they wanted until the end of the French-Indian War. The colonies started to come together because of, of, of a few things. One, the Great Awakening. Uh, you get uh, these preachers that traveled throughout the colonies. Uh, George uh, Whitfield is a great example that gave the colonies a common theme, this, this re religious revival that kind of started bringing these colonists from different areas together based on a similar idea. You also start getting, and this happened and established slowly, this intercolonial trade, where now we start seeing products from one colony going to another, transfer of goods, and with that transfer of goods, we get this idea of a transfer of ideas, and people start seeing these colonies. Now, maybe more important than anything was the Seven Years' War and the French-Indian War which really brought the people together as colonists fought for a similar cause from all over the 13 colonies fighting the French. Okay, It really established this idea of the colonies being one. Along with that, a great way to disseminate information was our colonial newspapers. White males uh, in the colonies were highly educated, and when I say highly educated, could read, especially in the north, probably not as much in the south, which will be a common theme um, for a long time in American history. And so you were able to give them the uh, enlightenment ideas, the uh, revolutionary ideas that were coming about. You were allowed to spread information from one colony to another, you know, hearing about the Boston Massacre uh, down in South Carolina, North Carolina is going to be critical to build this cause. There's also this idea uh, of, um, of 
self-government that is going to come about um, during this. We talked about it in modern world history. Enlightenment thinkers, especially John Locke with his idea of life, liberty, and property, we'll see Thomas Jefferson take that in the Declaration of Independence, were huge in getting people to say, why can't we have self-government? Why can't the people govern themselves without interference from the British, especially as they started to clamp down on the colonies after the French Indian War? And we started to reject this idea of parliamentary sovereignty or that parliament had supreme power. We just didn't see that. And, and it came about uh, also because of this British ignorance and instability that they looked down on the colonists. They felt they were inferior. Uh, they felt that they were ungrateful for what the British did in the um, French Indian War. And then also from the colonist view that the British uh, didn't want them to expand uh, westward and, and they didn't want the best for them. They were only using them as uh, loyal subjects. And an idea that we'll see and it will become a mainstay, especially when we get to our constitution, is this idea of republicanism. That a just society or in which all citizens willingly um, basically give up themselves for the greater good of the republic or the greater good of the majority. Okay, and so this idea is going to come about. And so not only do we start seeing this national identity, but our political landscape and our ideas of what government should be start slowly changing. And there's going to be two things that bring that about. We are going to get two important and critical causes to the American Revolution that are going to build this. So we get this idea of the national identity, colonists coming together, becoming more united for various reasons. Also this idea of politics and what's best for the people and what's best for the common good. And it surrounds the reason that those come to a head and, and come about with the American Revolution where we want to govern ourselves is this idea of mercantilism. Now, the British felt that they needed to export more than they imported, which means you were going to sell more goods, meaning you're going to bring in more money which will make you more powerful. And they saw the colonies in North America, especially after the French Indian War, as a perfect place for this. Large markets in the colonies and good natural resources. Okay, And that this would help the British Empire become even greater after the French Indian War or the Seven Years' War. The Seven Years' War, however, is going to put Britain in this huge uh, hole um, economically-wise. They're going to have this huge debt that they need to pay off, and they don't know how to pay it off. But the rationale comes back, and I can see where it's coming from, is why don't we just have the colonists pay? And this is going to be key. The question is who's going to pay, and it's going to be the colonists. And one of the first things that you can kind of see makes the colonists mad, if you look at these pictures, is this proclamation line of 1763. It's basically going to say that British soldiers couldn't protect colonists anymore if they moved westward, especially from Native American attacks. Uh, and, and so they're going to put a line here and tell the colonists, you can't move west. The colonists, on the other hand, said, hey, we helped you fight in the French Indian War. We now have the right to move west, and you're going to see that conflict rise. Again, it's how do you pay these British soldiers, and if you're going to have more land, and you're going to have these colonies expand, and you want greater control of these colonies, you have to protect these colonists. But if they're going farther west, you're going to need most, more soldiers, which are going to cost more, and you don't have the money to do that. So we need to start taxing people. And so we start seeing these acts. And you need to understand it in this way. There's going to be an act, and then there's going to be a reaction by the colonists. And it's all going to be based on this idea of actual versus virtual representation. It's going to start with the Sugar Act. Now, the Sugar Act really didn't affect everyone, so we don't really talk about it much besides being the first. It really just affected the wealthy, which is a small percentage, uh, and, and so it doesn't do much. The Quartering Act, uh, we'll see, will become uh, 
more important as the years go by as the soldiers uh, British soldiers try to enforce these acts even more and more and we'll also see it that the colonists really resented this as they re resented it so much to put it in our Bill of Rights with the Constitution. The act that really kicks it all off is the Stamp Act of 1765. Now this put a tax on all paper goods so it affects all colonists. So now, instead of it being just a small group, we have all colonists who are going to feel the implications of British now trying to take more control. And they're getting away from this idea of salutary neglect, which occurred before the French Indian War, where basically the, they let the colonies uh, just run um, themselves. And this is why we got all these self-governments, like the House of Burgesses. The Stamp Act is basically going to say, no, 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 we're going to kind of uh, class around you and we're going to start taxing you and and there's going to be a couple protests to this you're going to get the sons of liberty and the daughters of liberty who are going to take to the streets okay and, and they're going to be labeled the radicals okay or the anarchist okay at first uh, these people are going to uh, basically enforce what they call non-importation agreements that come about because the stamp act at Congress, which we'll talk about in a, minute, in a minute, they're going to tar and feather um, British government officials. They're going to ransack government officials' homes. Uh, they're they're basically going to be the radicals. A more uh, moderate protest was seen with the Stamp Act Congress in 1765, where 27 delegates from nine of the 13 colonies will come together, together and basically give their grievances to the king, which are largely ignored. But the significance is that it brought colonial leaders together. It's going to lead to the Continental Congresses. Okay. What we do get out of this is the non-importation agreement. Basically, we are not going to import British goods. We're not going to buy British goods. We're actually going to start uh, making those ourselves. And we're going to boycott. And this is really going to hurt Britain economically. And so Britain is going to fill this. And so they are going to repeal the Stamp Act in 1766 with the Declaratory Act. Now, colonists celebrated, right? We, we got the Stamp Act repealed. However, the Declaratory Act is basically going to say that, yes, we're going to repeal it. It was a bad act. We're sorry. But Parliament has the right to bind the colonies in all cases whatsoever. And that's language from that act. Basically saying we can do whatever we want. That virtual representation is right and just and we will enforce it. And so they are going to draw the line in the sand. The line has been set 10 years before the Declaration of Independence. Now, as we continue, uh, you get the Townsend Revenue Act. Basically, what they're saying is we're going to bring in more British government officials, not only governors, but judges. And we're going to bring more in and you're going to pay for them. And so this is what those acts were for. And so you also get protests and probably the best example of protest and one that will be highlighted and used by revolutionaries to get to the American Revolution is the Boston Massacre. Now, what side started it? Great question. And you can make an argument that the British soldiers started it. You can make an argument that the uh, protesters started it. Whatever you view, it is going to be a rallying, rallying cry for the colonists and those revolutionaries. And they're going to build on the momentum of that. Interesting side note here. John Adams, the second president, defended the British soldiers because he felt that a law came above ideals and that everyone had a right to fair trial. We get those Townsend Acts. Uh, this is going to continue. Okay, it, it's really going to uh, – another fun fact. Let me back backtrack a little bit. Crispus of Tux was the first colonist killed in, you would say, this American revolutionary period or lead up. He was a Native American and African American, ironically. Two of the – groups that are going to be uh, the most mistreated uh, in American history, uh, one could argue. Uh, but this is going to basically these towns and revenue acts trying to make money uh, to pay for all the British officials and the French Indian War aren't really going to do a whole lot. But what it's going to bring about is the Committee of Correspondence. Uh, 
And this is going to be started by Sam Adams, who's going to be a huge member of the Sons of Liberty. It's going to spread to the colonies, and then these correspondence is going to go from one colony to another. It is going to keep the, the, um, the dialogue about why we're resisting British rule and why we want to become independent going uh, during this, this kind of this slow time. As you can see, uh, Boston Massacre, 1770, TX, not till 1773. So it's going to keep these revolutionary ideas going in the colonies. And all colonies are going to have them. It's going to start at a, a local level and then build up to a colonial level and then in, from one colony to another. Okay, Virginia is going to be one of those colonies really behind that. And then you get the Tea Act, which was basically Britain's way to try to make sure the East India Company uh, didn't go bankrupt and close. Okay, they wanted to sell East Indian tea in the colonies rather than colonists buying whatever they like to buy. This is going to make the colonies really mad. You're going to get the Boston Tea Party, but just not in Boston. I mean, that's going to be a huge thing but you're also going to get Philadelphia and New York forcing ships to go back to England. You're going to get Maryland who's actually going to burn ships. Okay. Boston's act uh, was just, I guess, extreme. Okay. It was radical and, and Sons of Liberty uh, led the charge there. And so uh, with that, is going to be kind of the last straw for Britain. And they're going to really come down on uh, the colonists with the coercive acts or what will be called the intolerable acts. Basically, they took away Massachusetts uh, government representation in the colony. They closed Boston Harbor. They said the army can, the British soldiers can stay with whoever they wanted, whenever they wanted. And British officials, if they did something wrong, would it be tried in Britain and not the colonies, which would be different. As we saw in the Boston Massacre, those British soldiers were tried in the colonies. The Quebec Act was also a part of that, so there was five. But what this brought about was the First Continental Congress, and this is where we'll pick up in the next lecture that you'll get Monday.